Joining us now is McKeel Haggerty, the CEO of Haggerty. It has become way more than just insurance. They do all sorts of things right now. If you're an enthusiast, you probably use one of the many different things they do. Maybe you get their magazine. How's it going, McKeel? How is everything? Oh, great. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, lots of things going on in the car world, the world in general, and of course, the collector space. You know, you guys are really, I think, at the forefront of many of the things, the changes we're seeing uh, in the enthusiast landscape. Um, first of all, let's kind of start off with just some general trends. What are you seeing right now as the enthusiast landscape takes shape in 2022? Well, the, the car world, the enthusiast landscape is is really red hot and it's red hot driven by a number of things. Uh, you know, we're seeing it in, in sales, we're seeing it in evaluations, we're seeing it in, in all sorts of energy around the media space. Um, so it's, it's growing from a transactional standpoint, values are going up and it's getting younger. Um, the, at least the owners are getting younger and the cars are getting newer. Uh, so those are the, those are the highlights and it, it's painting a pretty good picture if you're into the car world. I think it's interesting when you look at, you know, values and interest by decades growing up, coming up in like the eighties and nineties, you know, it seemed like you'd always hark back right to the fifties, just because frankly, that's how all of like culture was at that point. And now what you're seeing maybe is, is you get a little bit older, some gray hair and such, you know, suddenly the seventies and eighties are quite far away. You know, these are, it's, it's different. It's a new generation of collector and you're seeing people who do have some income looking to spend money on those cars, perhaps as opposed to, you know, the Duesenbergs or things like that. So what are you seeing, I guess, is that, you know, it's like people, people get older and they age and, you know, the preferences and tastes do sort of evolve. Yeah, I think there's always been this kind of golden ageism, if you will, in the car world where people just sort of picked an era and said, that's the best era. That was the era. That's the only collectible era. That's the only era of cars that are going to be highly sought after by people with, with means. And you're right. Like when I first got into this world, it was the, the 90s when I started taking over this little family business in northern Michigan. And, and certainly that was an era when it was an older generation, very interested in 50s cars. It wasn't that pre-war cars weren't important, but 50s cars were the hot thing. And that's how you'd see at car shows and at auctions. And then it wasn't that long after, about a decade after that, when it was the muscle cars. Um, you know, muscle cars really took off, exploded in a positive sense, right? The, the market exploded. And uh, we saw that huge run up to the to the middle sort of 2000s. And uh, now we've moved beyond it. Like you said, it's it's uh, it's cars that are newer cars in the 70s were considered to be before kind of lower quality. It was the beginning of environmental regulations and other regulations sort of suppressing maybe the quality of performance of cars, even though there were some notable standouts. But when you got up in the 80s cars where high performance cars and, and other cool cars be, were more mass produced and really produced in much greater numbers to them. As I look at now, when people say, what do you think about the car world today? And I said, if there's a golden age ever, it's right now. You know, some of these story brands are building thousands of cars per year where they used to build hundreds. Um, it's an exciting time to be in the car world. And by eliminating that golden ageism, you realize just how big this car market is and how vibrant it is. Now you talk about how your your family company has grown since you know you really joined it in the '90s, uh, and boy, the '90s are starting to seem like they were a little farther away now too. Uh, it's really been quite a road for you guys, you know, culminating with you know a stock listing uh, last year. Tell me what that was like to experience that growth, to lead that growth, and what does that stock listing enable you guys to do going forward? Oh, thank you. It was uh, last year um, was an extraordinary year, getting ready to go public uh, as a company. We were a closely held family business uh, from its inception back in the 1980s. And, you know, it's fun to work as a, as a smaller business and watch it grow and, uh, you know, hit that first milestone of maybe 100 employees and then 200 and then 500, 1,000 and beyond. And, you know, growing to other countries besides the United States. And all of that was really fun to do. And it's, you know, it's just that the pleasure of a job well done in and of itself growing it, not just a company, but a brand, because we're, we're really proud of the way we built our brand in the automotive space and expanding beyond insurance. But when you really think about the long term of where we were trying to go, when we started realizing this is a much bigger world, it's international, it's global in nature. There are lots of other opportunities for a company like ours to take advantage of. Ultimately, it's like, well, how do you take that next leap in scale? Um, and there are lots of ways to do it um, as a, you know, as a CEO, as a company, you can take on debt, you can bring in investors. You know, our approach of, of going public was, 
I felt really threaded a lot of needles, which is to allow, you know, the founding owners to remain in as founding owners and, and you know, continue to have high influence over the company, but also to invite um, team members and, and be able to get, recruit new people and to use, um, you know, a new form of uh, currency in the form of stock to be able to track high level talent. Um, and also to just get, uh, you know, get after some of the big dreams and projects that that we had going forward. So, you know, we went officially public, I, I think it was first listing day was actually December 3rd, uh, 2021. And we rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange on December 6th. And already this year, we started, you know, making some announcements about some new things that we're doing, like, uh, uh, you know, moving into a, a pretty heavy investment in the marketplace space with an investment in the Broad Arrow Group, a newly formed uh, marketplace company. So um, you can kind of see some of the things that we've been thinking about and going public is helping make it happen. One of the things that I think is interesting that you guys have really been ramping up in the last year is your involvement with the different concours. Um, you know, the one that really piqued my interest because I've watched it change a lot is the one here in Michigan and yeah. Meadowbrook. Then it was out in Plymouth. And then looks like next year it's going to be down at the Detroit Institute of Arts, which sounds like an amazing you know location. It's a great museum. Um, so I think it's just looking at all these different events. You know, what is the vision? How do you use these to reach, you know, different, you know, enthusiasts who, you know, maybe didn't don't even know what a concours is. They can't even say the word. Right. But, you know, what's the vision there? Well, our, the purpose of our company is to save driving and car culture for future generations. And I know it sounds kind of wonky or maybe, you know, head in the sky, but I'm, I'm really serious about it. I mean, I, I know for you and for, you know, so many of your you know, readers and listeners that you know, driving just means a lot to them. Cars are cool, driving, all the experiences around it. And the reason we talk about not just thinking that we need to be there to help support that activity of driving fun stuff long into the future, but car culture isn't just about this notion of a single person driving their car, kind of the, you know, the man in the arena image of, you know, they're just you working on your car and driving it. Car people gather, you know, they gather at car events, they gather online, uh, they read media, uh, they compete in motorsport events, whether on an amateur or um, you know, recreational or professional basis. So the car world has always had this social aspect. And we felt that car shows were something that uh, were really an important part of our mission. And, you know, concours, we kind of started at the high end, um, you know, with the Greenwich Concours, um, the uh, Concours of America that we are moving to Detroit. And we're also moving it from the middle of summer to September. Um, and then Amelia Island, which is, you know, really a wonderful, wonderful event that happens uh, next month in, in March uh, down in Fernandina Beach, Florida. And the idea here is by preserving some of these, you know, these uh, organizations and really championing the fact that we think all cars are cool, but some of them are just jewels and they need to be celebrated in a really high end way. Uh, Concours are a great way to do that. Um, you know, we could invest in, in the events themselves, make them a little bit more modern. Uh, evolve the format of the events so that you still highlight the best of the best cars, but do it where you welcome more young people in, uh, you know, and youth and, and other things, create more media opportunities, better technology around them, all of that sort of thing. So the vision is by having kind of a portfolio of events, um, it, it allows you to put a little scale into them, create more value for sponsors. Um, I've been a sponsor, <laughs> Haggerty's been a sponsor of literally thousands of car events through the years. And I know what it's like to write those checks. Um, when you're when your sponsor just wanted to get your wares out there, your services out there, and we're going to be able to offer a lot more value to our sponsors by having more than just one event out there. So, um, you know, look for more of this in our future. But that's the mission. And, and you're right. We're so excited about uh, this new uh, change of venue for that Concord of America downtown Detroit. Is there a better you know, it's Motor City. And it's also, you know, Motor City wasn't just about uh, an industrial reality, an industrial city. There's always been really high culture between Motown, Detroit Institute of Art, Center for Creative Studies, all of that stuff happening right there. And we're going to be in the center of it. Uh, and we're super excited. Yeah, that to, to really drill down on that, that, you know, the Concord of America, it's going to be really, it's right, it's on Woodward Avenue, which is iconic in its own right. Um, you know, inside the DIA, many of you who, probably know about industry. They have a famous mural, Diego Rivera, talking about, you know, working, manufacturing, coming of age for the industrial age. It's, it sounds pretty exciting. Parking's a little tricky down there. You've got a football at a baseball stadium, but I'm sure you guys will figure that out. 
Well, that's... actually, between CCS and, and the library, uh, we're going to have great secure parking there. You know, we've heard a lot of people say, oh, I don't know if I want to go down and park. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be perfect. So we're really excited about that. How do you guys sort of differentiate these different concours so that it's it's sort of like not just like the same thing, but in a different geographic location? How do you guys provide some differentiation? What's your plan on that front? Well, car events um, all have different characters. Um, you know, you, you think of the, the great car events that happen around the world. I knew when I was, you know, growing up reading car magazines and I always wanted to go to Geneva or I wanted to go to the Detroit Auto Show or I wanted to go to New York or L.A. And when I started going to them professionally and going to the Concours events like this or racing events, we know they're all a little bit different. Some of it's culturally driven, just the geography of it. Uh, sometimes it's the type of vehicles that they celebrate. Uh, you take Amelia Island. Uh, which is coming up uh, here in March. Amelia Islands, I was kind of been the, the race car driver's uh, concour, where great, great concour, high-end cars are celebrated along with great race cars who are driven by some of the true legends of motorsport. And that needs to be preserved at Amelia Island. And uh, we're super excited that we're going to have uh, Chip Ganassi as our honoree this year and be celebrating his, uh, you know, not only his... Uh, his, his past career, but also really looking forward to, uh, you know, his current involvement in, in motorsport going forward. So that's important. You think on, when you think Detroit, you think big three, you think of all the innovation that's happened through the years. You think of that, you know, the styling, the design, all that stuff that happened right around the Detroit area. And many people who are, will be the attendees at that event, just coming in, buying tickets to show up. Those are people who work in the industry and they want to celebrate that stuff and go look at great designs in the past. So, um, each one has its character. They need to be preserved, but then you have to evolve. them. And that's where, you know, I mentioned I'm, I'm pretty passionate about getting the next generation involved. So this doesn't mean dummying down the show. It just make just we want to make them really family friendly. So we'll have kid zones and youth judging programs and and other things that can bring families together around a car event rather than no mom and dad are going to go to the car event and the kids are going to stay at home. Uh, so it's really it's just super important for me that we make, you know, car events kid friendly and that we create on ramps to the car world. So our kid zone at our events, uh, you know, it's, it's racing simulators. It's, you know, it's little design competitions. It's uh, it's all sorts of fun activities that kids can do. Uh, when we first did one of these at the Greenwich Concours uh, late last year or, or last year, I guess it was, <laughs> we moved it because of COVID. You know, we had one of the actual Lightning McQueen cars uh, we just, you know, we had Jay Ward from, uh, you know, Disney Pixar there to talk to kids about animation and what the Cars franchise. So those are the things we need to do. Celebrate the great stuff. Keep the geography and the special character of each event there and keep it special, but then evolve it for the next generation. If you said Lightning McQueen was going to be at a car show, my son would be like, I'd be, I'll be there any second. I, I, I'm i there any second. And me too. I mean, who doesn't like cars, right? It's, it's well, I, I don't think, I think it may be about the only car I took a picture in front of for my daughter. There so there you go. I'm curious you talk about onboarding, onroading the next, you know, generation. There's a lot of things that are about to really change the industry, you know, from electrification, which is changing the industry to autonomous cars. I think the, the former, I don't necessarily think that impacts enthusiasts in any way, makes mm -hmm. things different, but it can make them even better. Yeah. Autonomous, that changes things a little bit. And that may be where we start to steer into like infrastructure, transportation, yeah. rather than automotive enthusiasm. What's your take on these? I don't know if headwinds is the right way to, you know, spell it out. But I mean, how are you feeling about these these changes? As they I say? think that's fair. I think it, it goes and, and I get this question all the time. So I'm glad we're talking about it as you know, real car enthusiasts uh, I, I, like you. I'm not threatened by and and I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the electrification of cars. I think it's a natural evolution. And if you've driven and I'm sure you have a, a higher performance version of a modern electric car, they're just outrageously good. Uh, you know, they're, the torque is instantaneous. They're fun. And I, I think they're just going to be a big part of the car world. Not only are you going to see more in the new car space, I think you're going to see some really thoughtfully done great conversions of vintage cars into EVs um, that you know maintain the integrity of the and styling and and the coolness of the original car, but make them electric. And you know, my view is if the only way 
a future collector will drive a certain sort of vintage cars if it has an EV, if it's thoughtfully done, I'm all for it. So that's great. And by the way, we have a long, long history of repowering our cars through the decades. So uh, anybody who gets kind of too precious about it, it kind of it kind of bugs me. But I also love internal combustion engine cars, and they're going to be around for decades and decades, long past my uh, planning horizon. Even if you look at the most ambitious um, you know, changeover to all electric uh, new vehicle sales, we're a long way away, and it'll be decades down the road uh, when internal combustion engine cars and EVs will have to be next to each other. You're right. Uh, autonomous vehicles represents maybe a different kind of headwind. Uh, and I think it's as much about um, congestion in cities as it is about cars or transportation. You, you mentioned infrastructure, and I, I think you're right. I, I think there will be places in long into the future that it might be pretty tough to drive a manually driven car. Uh, you know, think the, sit, you know, the center of Manhattan. Um, I did an interview um, right after our listing in, uh, in December uh, driving a BMW 2002 in the middle of Manhattan. And I will tell you, it was uh, it was a handful <laughs> you know, trying to drive that car in traffic. So those are going to come soon enough. But I think, you know, our mission of, of saving driving is, is not meant to save the long commute in a city. Our mission of saving driving is to save the pleasure of driving, going out on a windy road, going out to a, a racetrack or a driving facility, going on a tour of Highway 1 or where we live in Michigan, like you said, Woodward or M22 in Michigan. Uh, those types of roads that were built for tourism, built for touring. And the best way we believe to see them is with your hands on the wheel, driving a cool car. So we're going to be we're going to be advocating for that. Haggerty's going to be here fighting for that. And it's one of the reasons we went public. We, we, we don't think this is this saving driving and car culture is going to happen on its own. Uh, we wanted to really invest for that future long term. So I mentioned you have a number of cars that might be in your garage. What's what's your go-to daily driver? What do you drive on the weekends? You know, how do you, how do you unwind with you know your automotive enthusiasm in a personal sense? Well, thanks. Well, I live in northern Michigan, so it's the middle of winter right now. So uh, if you don't have a great SUV, uh, that is a, it's you are really <laughs> making it hard on yourself. Uh, so my my daily driver in the winter time is I have one of the Range Rover Sport SVRs. The 575 horsepower car. So uh, with a nice set of uh, 22 Nokians on it, it does pretty well in the wintertime and it's a lot of fun. Um, in the summer, I drive a variety of vintage cars largely. I still have my very first car, my 67 Porsche 911 S. Uh, I bought it when I was 13. And as I, I kind of tell people, you know, I, I will I will grow old with that car. I may have lots of other cars, but I'll always have that one. And my my goal is that's usually the first one I bring out in the spring, kind of the last one I drive before the snow flies every fall. Um, but I have another a number of other cool cars and um, that, that I've been kind of fortunate to collect. Uh, you know, Shelby GT500. I have a you know E-Type Jaguar, um, Aston Martin DB4, and some muscle cars and all sorts of. I like all sorts of things. I my big. Uh, um, sort of COVID touring gift for myself was a pre-war Bentley. Um, I was so jealous of all those Bentley people driving around on the hundredth anniversary of these you know, pre-war cars that seem to go fast and be reliable and they look super cool. So I, I found a really preserved example in the UK and I enjoyed tooling around at that. And sometimes in a cool old car like that, going 35 miles an hour, 45, 55 is, is just plenty fast enough. That sounds, that sounds like a pretty good time. That sounds like a pretty good time. Mikhail Haggerty, he's the CEO of Haggerty. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.